we are encouraged to live and create a brave community where you can be your authentic self, where you can share not only the good parts of your story, but the really difficult parts of your story, trusting that our faith is made whole in community. Today, we continue in our focus on this renewed sense of mission that we feel God is calling us into to connect people to true abundance in Christ. Last week, you know that we began this journey orienting ourselves around what true abundance looks like. And we spoke about how it's different than how the world defines abundance. It's not wrapped up in what we accomplish, accumulate, our achievements, our success. True abundance is wrapped up in who God is and the gifts that God gives us freely. Last week, we oriented ourselves around this gift of faith and how we're called to live a bright faith. Even in the midst of dark situations in our lives, we're called to light our lamp and put it on a lampstand so that all can see. And I began this journey telling you a little bit about my personal story and how I came to wrestle and lose faith and find it again as a soldier in Iraq. This week, I continue sharing a little bit of that story as we look at another mark of true abundance, one that we find God is giving us again and again and again, the gift of community. I think intuitively we all know that real abundance, real human flourishing only happens in our lives. We only experience it when we are surrounded by a brave, beautiful community. We all crave it, introverts and extroverts alike. Every person, I believe, has a fundamental need to not only be seen, but to be welcomed and to be loved to be fully known by somebody else so that your life has added meaning and value as other people can witness to your life. And yet, when we look at society, when we look at culture today, we see this rising epidemic of loneliness. One of the things our vision task force focused on and studied and explored during our process was a recent Surgeon General's health report that came out last year that said one of the rising epidemics, health crises facing America is the epidemic of loneliness. We have more people today that experience crippling isolation than ever before. We seem to be a more connected society than ever digitally, and yet Physically and emotionally, we don't feel very connected very often. And that's why connecting people is at the front end of this renewed mission. We really believe that God wants us to connect people to one another and ultimately to a vision of a brave community where we can be our authentic selves, to be known and to be loved. And yet, I've been wrestling and thinking about this and what I would preach this week, and I came around to wrestling with this reality that even though we know it's true that God wants us to have community, even though we're encouraged again and again in the body of Christ to be brave, to be authentic, to be ourselves, sometimes we struggle to practice it. Sometimes it's really difficult for us to get out of our own way, to be vulnerable, and to invite other people into our real, messy, imperfect lives. We all know what it's like to put on our Sunday's best and to put on our best face and to come to worship, and we have this sneaking thought that if people really knew what I was dealing with, struggling with, well, then maybe I wouldn't be as accepted as I feel. I think if we're going to be the community God wants us to be, we've got to find ways to get past that, to embrace this gift fully. And to orient ourselves around this message, we look at a familiar passage in Matthew chapter 10. 
couple of weeks ago, actually, I, I preached a message on the same concept through Luke's gospel where Jesus was sending out the disciples two by two. But in Matthew's version, we have something that honestly, over the years, I've scratched my head at a little bit. I've always wondered, Jesus, what are you doing here in Matthew? Did, did you pick up how he sent the disciples? We all know the gifts he gives them to cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leper, amazing gifts to go out and preach, teach, heal, do the ministry work. But did you hear the, the warning or the admonition he gave them of where not to go? I've always scratched my head and thought, what are you doing, Jesus? He says right here, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans. Rather, only go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And I've always read that and thought, this doesn't sound like you, Jesus. I know the end of Matthew's gospel in Matthew 28, he says, go to all the world. When I read through the scriptures, I see time and again, Jesus isn't closing up circles. He's always expanding them. He's always sending people to the ends of the earth. He's healing people of different backgrounds. Why? Why did Jesus not want his disciples to go to the Gentiles or to the Samaritans? And as I've been thinking about it, I, I wonder. I wonder if the first time Jesus sent the disciples, he didn't want them to practice being brave and learning the gift of community in environments and neighborhoods in which they were familiar. I think Jesus is certainly going to get them to move and swim past the breakers. But for now, I wonder if the real lesson wasn't even as much learning how to heal and teach and raise the dead as it was to learn how to live in community. Jesus is sending them into the villages they come from. He's sending them into the synagogues in which they're already known. He's sending them into the marketplaces that they already buy their food. And I think it's on purpose. I don't know about you, but for me, sometimes it's hard to be my authentic, brave self with the people who should know me the best. I don't think you're all that dissimilar. How many of us skip certain topics at Thanksgiving tables on purpose? It's one thing for us to be encouraged to go, be brave, be bold out in the world. It's a whole nother thing to practice it where we're already known. Here's my story. I shared with you last week that I found this newfound faith as a soldier in Iraq and I, I came home from the war and... I want to pick up from there. I bought into this notion, sort of subconsciously, as I came home from the war, that I didn't need anyone. And I did what a returning veteran should never do who had a couple of years of college to finish at Ohio State. My deployment was in between my college career. I, I volunteered to go active duty out of the reserves for two years for this deployment. And so coming home from Iraq, I had to finish college. And as I came home, I rented a one bedroom studio apartment and lived by myself. I knew I didn't want to live at the fraternity house anymore because I just couldn't do it. I remember that fall coming back onto campus, being invited by my former community, the fraternity, up to some activities and parties. And as I made my way there, I, I found myself three or four times leaving after about 45 minutes. It was great to see people that I was in relationship with, but at the same time, I couldn't do it anymore. Lorne after the war was very different than Lorne before and all of a sudden playing beer pong and talking about 
sophomore college thing seemed so trivial given what I had just experienced. I had a really hard time wrapping my mind around this life given the life that I still was trying to figure out. And so I settled into my routine and I would go to class and I would study finishing my political science degree and I'd go to the library and study by myself and then I would walk back to 13th Avenue to that little studio apartment and I would enter in around 6 p.m. every night and I would read and I would do my assignments and I would sit alone in a dark room for months. I couldn't go to the football games anymore because when Ohio State scored a touchdown and they'd let that cannon off, I, I couldn't do it. I was slowly withering away in my isolation. I had this faith, but even that grew sick because this pervasive illness of individualism had crept into that even. My faith meant so much to me at the time, so much so that in my little studio apartment, there was the bathroom and there was the kitchenette and there was the bed and there was my desk. And on the desk, there was one stack of law school applications and on the other side, there were applications to seminary. Sort of at this crossroads, what do I feel called to doing? I, the dream was to, was to go to law school and then become a state senator in the great state of Ohio. I'm glad I didn't choose that route. <laughs> nothing against law, nothing against state senators, but I don't know. <laughs> kind of happy where I am. Um, and I'd sit at that desk all alone, and after a while, I recognized I needed people. The problem was I couldn't be around them. I wasn't good company. And so I thought if the fraternity won't do it, if the other student activities are too much, then maybe I'll, I'll try to find a church. And so I started my journey over the winter and spring semester of visiting all of these campus ministries. And I had grown up Lutheran at Messiah Lutheran Church in Reynoldsburg, Ohio, and I swore to myself coming back from Iraq, I am not going to a Lutheran church. They have hard, cold, wooden pews, and I'm not doing They did not have Good Shepherd padded pews. So I visited Young Life and New Life and Real Life and Old Life. And like all, I visited all of the campus ministry. I went to the Newman Center, the Catholic ministry. I went to the Episcopalian ministry. I went to the Southern Baptist ministry. And the first or second time I would show up to one of their activities, I was welcomed with open arms at every one of these diverse Christian communities. When a new student comes to a campus ministry, the students within it and the leaders of that ministry are thrilled. You would think like I entered the pearly gates of heaven. Oh my gosh, welcome. We're so glad you're here. I had this buzz cut. I was really serious at the time. They're, what are we going to do with him? And, um, and it was great. But I noticed a pattern. After the fourth or fifth time of showing up to one of these events, the tone changed from welcome and we're glad you're here and I felt as if I was being put through a litmus test. Does he believe the things we believe? Does he behave how we behave? And I realized that in a lot of these ministries, you either had to be a conservative fundamentalist or a liberal fundamentalist. And if you weren't one of the two, you didn't really belong. I didn't feel like I fit in anywhere. I didn't know what I believed. I was wrestling. I was dealing with my own trauma. All I needed was a safe space that I felt like I could be my authentic self, but I couldn't find it even in the churches. And so when I had all but given up hope, one day I'm walking up 13th Avenue and I'm walking back to my studio apartment and I pass for the umpteenth time this weird building that looked like a church, but I didn't know if it was a church and it had a sign out front that said, Jacob's Porch. What the heck is that? I got back into my apartment and I looked it up online. Wouldn't you know it was the Lutheran Campus Ministry? I thought, well, why not give it a shot? So that Sunday at 7 p.m., I went to worship, 
And I'll never forget when I walked in, there was David. David knew that I was new and I knew the routine. He's going to be really happy and really excited I'm here. And so David sat next to me in worship. And the whole time that, you know, we're singing and doing the thing, he's like looking at me. He's like looking at me. You, you know what that's like? You know, maybe you're new here and people are looking at you. Don't look at them. Just let them be. Um, <laughs> and, and he's like looking at me. And, and after worship, he says, hey, this week, we're going to go get some pizza, some guys, and we're going to throw the Frisbee on the oval. Do you want to join us? And I'm like, yes, I would love to join you. I need friends. I don't have any friends. So I met Dave and the guys, and we played Frisbee, and we, threw the, threw, we ate pizza and threw the Frisbee. And the next Sunday, I went back to worship. And then the next Sunday, I went back. And the next Sunday, I went back. And after the fifth or sixth time, I realized there was no litmus test. I could be me with all my doubts, with all my questions, with all my confusion, I could be me. And at the end of that spring semester, I'll never forget, Pastor Jay stood up and he said, next weekend is the most important weekend in worship all year. We've been building toward this all year. And we call the final worship service of the school year, Restoration Worship. And he went on to explain, I want every student to pack something with you to bring to worship and to leave here. But it needs to be something that represents pain or suffering or your doubt or your struggles. You need to pack it and come to worship and I'll explain more next week. And I left worship thinking, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> because I knew what I needed to pack. But I didn't want to let anyone into that part of my life. I couldn't be that brave. I thought of 10,000 excuses that week why I couldn't go to church. But wouldn't you know it, Sunday at 5 o'clock, Dave calls me. And he's like, hey, Lauren, do you have your item packed? Do you want to go to dinner and then to church? Oh, fine, Dave, fine. So Dave and I go and we get pad thai and... We have our backpacks. And you got your item? I got my item, but I'm not sharing it, Dave. It's like, well, we'll see. We go into worship, and Jay preaches this amazing sermon, and there's this cross with little tea votive candles, and he says, as you come forward for communion, I want you to bring your item and place it here. And he said, but here's the trick. When you come up, after you leave your item, I want you to take somebody else's item and I want you to take it home, and I want you to restore it. Jay was so brilliant because he was teaching us that in the body of Christ, we bear one another's burdens. In the faith community, we can help restore people's pain into a new purpose. Okay, I thought, we'll see how this goes. And the first couple of students that went up, I was even more convinced I'm not going to open my backpack. Because these girls, nothing against the girls, but they brought out these little picture frames and they had photos of the boyfriend that had dumped them. And I'm not saying that's not impactful, but I knew these girls and they only dated the guys for like two and a half weeks. I'm like, you, you went on three dates. You can get over it. And I'm thinking, if this is what this is about, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. until another girl stood up and with tears in her eyes streaming down her face she walked toward the cross and she pulled out of her pocket a little makeup case you know the kind that you open and it has a mirror in it and she turned around and she shared with us what we had all suspected she said, earlier this year, and for the first two years of college, I have struggled with an eating disorder. But because of this church, I started going to the mental health services. And I feel so much better than I did, but I need to lay down this makeup case because for two years, I would carry it in my pocket and all throughout the day, I would open it up. And as I looked at my reflection in that mirror, I was convinced I was not beautiful. And I need to lay this down because this church has taught me that I am beautiful. 
And when she had the bold, brave courage to bear her authentic self in front of the community, I knew that I couldn't keep my item in my backpack any longer. And for the first time, after returning home from the war, I unzipped that backpack and I brought out a full combat uniform. And I stood, I turned around and told my peers that I have pretended all semester to be this confident, brave soldier who has life all figured out. He's either going to go to law school or go to seminary. Either way, I'm going to be great and I don't need anyone. But the reality is I am struggling. I feel all alone in readjusting back to civilian life. I'm waking up most nights with terrible nightmares and I need to lay this down. And I made my way back to my beanbag chair because it's a campus ministry. And I watched in horror as all of these students descended on my uniform and ripped patches off. And I'm like, ah, you're disgracing the uniform. And they took my pants and someone took a hat and someone took my top. And, and then after worship, Hannah and Ryan, two of my good friends came up to me and they said, we knew it. We knew you were struggling. I think it's time you maybe get some counseling at the VA. When you set up the appointment, we'll drive you. And that started about five years of intensive therapy. You see, we have to learn to get past the walls we artificially build if we want to experience true, authentic community. The story doesn't end there. Years later, years later, I decided to fill out the seminary applications and not the law school ones. I began my journey at Trinity Lutheran Seminary the flagship seminary of the ELCA. I went on internship in Colorado. I moved back to Cincinnati. I served a year at First Lutheran and over the Rhine. And then I received this call to be ordained years after that worship service. And my first week at work at Prince of Peace, I'm in my new office and I moved in. I've got my books on the bookshelf feeling, you know, great. And the secretary says, Pastor Lauren, you have mail. What? I'm brand new. She, it's a box. Not this box, but one like it. And I opened it up. And I started crying as Pastor Jay, who was long gone from Jacob's porch, unbeknownst to me, had taken a part of my uniform years before. And he was saving it because he knew. He, knew, he knew. And he had pieces of that uniform sewn into my first stole. It's a purple stole for Lent because Lent is the season of pain and suffering that leads to a grand promise. And there was a note that said, every step is the way. Keep being brave, soldier. And you'll notice on that little pathway to the cross, the piece of my uniform's right in the middle. I don't know what your middle is. You might be going through it right now, where you feel alone and isolated, overwhelmed, you're unsure about your next step. Here's what I know is true your middle is not your end. And here at Good Shepherd, we are encouraged to live and create a brave community where you can be your authentic self, where you can share not only the good parts of your story, but the really difficult parts of your story, trusting that our faith is made whole in community. True abundance in Christ looks like a brave community. So may you be brave.